Hi there and welcome to the research software program call three webinar. I'm Laura Lamar and I'm the program operations manager. With me today are Scott Scott uh, I was going to say, Scott Henwood and he is program manager for the research software and I also have the director of finance Tracy Murray and she will be handling the second phase of this webinar. At the end of both portions, of each portion, we will be handling all the questions that you have. So at the end of Scott's portion of the webinar, the slide deck, you can ask questions then and you can type them in and we'll read them off and they'll answer them. And with that, I will hand, oh, and then we also have Hervé here to handle any of the French questions. Do you want to introduce yourself, Hervé? Oui, bonjour, mon nom c'est Hervé Guy, je suis analyste Le gestionnaire en analyse à Canary et je suis là pour adresser des questions en français. Merci. Merci, Hervé. And now it's over to Scott. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, I will note that um, uh, to ask questions, you need a laptop. So if anybody's dialed in uh, from a room, you'll, you'll need a laptop as well. Uh, and for the first part of the presentation, I'll, I'll be stopping at the end of each slide. So if there's any questions, we can we can deal with them then, or at the end is is fine too. So uh, just a little bit of uh, of history. Uh, Canary has been funding software to support uh, academic research for over a decade now. And uh, those of you who have uh, uh, been with us for a while, you know, in uh, the early days, we funded. Uh, researchers to hire software developers to develop uh, the software they needed uh, to do their research. And that worked out really well. We've, uh, we've funded dozens of platforms. Uh, some of them are still in use today uh, after over a decade, which is great for software systems of, of this size. Uh, but we noticed that uh, regardless of discipline, a lot of the platforms had the same functionality. Uh, we'd rather you concentrated on the research facing software rather than an infrastructure and so on. So over the past few years, we've been moving uh, towards, uh, you know, making making it so that researchers can can share software uh, rather than uh, duplicating from from scratch. Oh, looks like we have a sound problem. Uh, maybe we can uh, get Lance to have a look at that, and we'll continue on. I only hear half words. Is this better? Oops, I said it's better. How about how about now? Okay. Okay, we can go to the, the next slide, Claire. Uh, so what we've been doing in the past couple of years, including with this call, is instead of funding from scratch development of research software, we've been funding uh, groups who have existing research software platforms uh, to onboard new users. Uh, and, and that's sort of, that, that methodology is continuing with this call. So for those of you who have uh, been participants in the last couple of years, call three is very similar to uh, calls 2A and 2B that we've held uh, previously. Uh, we are, instead of doing, as I said, doing from scratch development, uh, we're asking uh, groups with existing research platforms to, to share their platforms with others, um, possibly across different disciplines, but uh, not necessarily. And uh, this program only supports academic uh, research software. Uh, in this case, academic means not commercial, so uh, not research that is intended to uh, primarily to make a, a product. Uh, we also provide long-term maintenance funding after the initial development period, and uh, that's contingent on continuing to grow your user base. Uh, 
Uh, so these are uh, sort of the high level dates. This is in the call documentation uh, as well, but just to review, uh, proposals will be due November 29th. We will announce the results right after Christmas uh, and immediately start working on agreements with the successful applicants. And the goal is to have the uh, development starting April 1st. So there's three uh, phases to this call, uh, each a year in length. Uh, the first one is a development phase, and we expect that if you're onboarding new users, you'll probably have to do some sort of uh, development to uh, uh, support them. And so there's a year for that. And at the end of that year, you should have uh, at least two new research teams onboarded and, and using the platform in their research. Uh, the second year is maintenance phase one. Uh, we sort of expect uh, maintenance activities, but also new development is allowed, assuming uh, your users are supported properly and so on. And during that time, uh, we want to get your new user count up to five. So that would be uh, three more in addition to the, uh, the two that you'd onboarded above. And then the, sec the third year, uh, maintenance phase two, is another maintenance phase where uh, there are no requirements to onboard new users. Uh, it's more a matter of supporting your existing community and of course uh, uh, enhancing the platform as, as the research needs dictate. Uh, so I'll go through uh, some of the uh, more common questions we get now and I'll stop at the end of each slide as I said for a moment if there's any questions. So you may have noticed that along with this call uh, we've announced a research data management call too. Uh, the RDM call is uh, focused on interoperability between existing platforms used for data management, and, and it's more focused at the national level, whereas uh, this research software call is uh, focused on adding new users to existing uh, research platforms, not necessarily at a, a sort of national uh, scope. Uh, can you submit proposals to both calls? Uh, yes, you can. The uh, call parameters are sufficiently different that it's unlikely that the same proposal would be suitable for both. So there would be, uh, if you were interested in both calls, uh, there would be uh, some extra work involved there. Uh, and just a note, we'll be selecting the successful RDM call to participants first. Uh, can funding be used to develop a new research platform from scratch with reuse in mind? Uh, we have done that in the past, but for this call, the goal is to uh, onboard new users to existing research platforms so that we're not continuing to grow the research platform ecosystem. And does the contributed platform have to have been originally funded by Canary? Uh, no, we're all about software reuse and it doesn't actually uh, matter where the platform Came, some, came from. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. We also allow commercial products, but since the, the rules of the call require that the software be made available for research purposes at no cost, uh, that, you know, that it's a bit of a hard sell for commercial entities. Uh, can the contributed platform already be usable uh, or have an established user base? Uh, that's great. Uh, this is, again, we're interested in, get, in getting as many researchers as possible access to the software they need and having an existing user base may actually help uh, convince the selection committee that, that you understand uh, how to support uh, new users. So, so that's great. Uh, does the platform have to be reusable across different disciplines? Uh, that's so, sort of the holy grail. Uh, if you can support uh, different disciplines, but there is value in supporting uh, multiple groups within your own discipline or, or related disciplines. So that, that is fine as well. Okay, good questions. Uh, do I have to share my instance of the platform with new research teams? Uh, we understand that if you have a, a platform up and running and maybe it's your own team and you have minimal user and group management that adding to that uh, to support new users would be overly complex. Uh, so it's, it's okay with us if you uh, create a new instance of an existing platform uh, to support your uh, new users. Uh, for those of you who have uh, participated in 
fairly recent Canary Research Software funding calls. Um, you can apply uh, to this call again. Uh, there are a few restrictions uh, for projects uh, that are currently in call 2A or 2B maintenance phases, and those are described in the, uh, in the call documentation. Uh, does the platform contributor need to have developed the platform which they are uh, proposing to add users? Uh, again, no. Uh, we have uh, several projects ongoing right now where the platforms were developed as open source by various community members uh, and the team that's acting as the contributor uh, were originally users who have some expertise in how the platform works and how they might uh, extend it and so on. Uh, if there's any researchers on the call who are, are looking for a platform to adopt, uh, we have a list of uh, platforms that we've uh, funded recently uh, at the link there. There's also some uh, platforms on that link that we didn't fund that our uh, community contributed. Uh, if you have a look at that list and you're interested in one, let us know and we can certainly put you in contact with the uh, PI. Uh, so just some clarification, uh, things we've learned from the last calls, uh, a new research team, uh, they have to, what is that? Uh, they have to be involved in academic research, and as I said earlier, the academic means uh, researchers that, research that is not focused on creating a commercial product. Um, we use the team, uh, the, the term research team here at Canary because uh, researchers tend to travel in groups, but it is conceivable that a, a research team could be an individual researcher and, and that's fine as well. And uh, either Canadian or national new, new research teams are eligible. So how will Canary know if, if uh, you've actually onboarded uh, the two teams you need to enable maintenance uh, phase one funding? And uh, we ask uh, for letters of confirmation from the new teams whenever they happen to be onboarded. Uh, ultimately in this call, we are asking for at least five new users, but you only need to provide uh, okay. letters from two of them uh, at the proposal stage. And, uh, you know, what happens if you, if you don't have the two uh, new research teams using the, um, using the platform at the beginning of the first maintenance page, uh, maintenance phase, sorry. Uh, you know, that's, that's sort of a big deal to us because that's sort of the point of this call. So, uh, you know, if there's a problem with that, uh, by all means, let us know and we'll try and work with you to, uh, to find other users or, or make some sort of accommodation. Uh, similarly, how will Canary uh, know that at least three more teams have been onboarded uh, at the beginning of maintenance phase two? And again, we'll ask for letters and we'll also ask for uh, updated letters from the original uh, new users just because it's, it will have been a while at that point. And uh, the rules around uh, maintenance two funding uh, regarding number of new users are the same for uh, uh, maintenance one. And again, you know, if you have any concerns, let us know as early as possible so we can work with you to try and uh, sort things out. Oh, there is a question there. Um, does the platform have to reuse existing software in Canary's uh, software catalog? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, we, those of you who have worked with us before uh, know that we did ask you to uh, look at the catalog and see if there's any software components that you could use. Uh, we encourage you to do that again in this call, but it's not a requirement for the proposal. Uh, do the new research teams have to be from my home institution? Uh, no, it uh, doesn't really matter where they're from. Uh, the only caveat there is that uh, we can only fund work uh, that's performed in Canada. Uh, and can I onboard more research teams in addition to those mentioned in my proposal? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things we're interested in is the, the reach of our funding and how it uh, helps researchers. Um, so if you onboard additional people, that's great. Uh, we ask that you let us know about that through our metrics collection system so, so we can understand uh, you know, how, how the funding uh, is, uh, is helping. Another question up here. So the PI of the team we onboard can be from outside Canada. Um, they can, uh, but they cannot uh, receive any funding or uh, contribute in kind. Uh, 
Um, okay, uh, my platform is already reusable by others, um, or I don't need the full development phase to make it reusable. Is this is a problem? Uh, no, uh, we'll get to this a little bit on the next slide, but maintenance activities uh, or traditional maintenance activities are, are permitted in the development phase. If you don't need to do a lot of development, that's fine. Um, and on the flip side, can I continue to enhance my platform during the maintenance phases? And, and again, the answer is yes, as long as your users are, are being supported. We understand that as research progresses, you might, uh, you might need some new functionality in the platform or you may find something that doesn't work uh, as well as you thought it would. And, and we're, we're okay with uh, uh, doing sort of new development during maintenance. So then you might be asking really what's the difference between development and maintenance uh, because we seem to allow both maintenance and development activities in, in uh, both types of phases and uh, really the boundaries are there to make sure that your uh, new users are onboarded and are actually using the platforms for research. So that's the, the primary uh, reason to, uh, to separate those phases. Uh, so that's it for the technical uh, uh, portion. Before I turn it over to Tracy, are there any uh, additional technical questions? Okay, great. Well, I'll start. If there's more technical questions, please um, include them in the chat window there, and we'll answer them at the end of the finance section. So welcome. Uh, I'm going to start with preparing your budget, which you're going to be doing uh, as you uh, prepare your proposals. And so is there anything that you need to consider before completing your preliminary project budget? Uh, so the first thing that um, and Scott uh, mentioned this a bit earlier is if you have received funding under our existing calls, uh, so funding call 2A or call 2B, the call 3 development, so this call, the development funding period will be adjusted to begin on the 1st of October. Um, activities from April 1st to September 2020 will be carried out using the existing Call 2A and Call 2B maintenance funding. Um, and so the next thing that you need to know is that all of the project costs must align with the schedule, schedule of eligible costs. So you'll find um, the schedule of eligible costs in the call materials. There's links to it in a number of different places. Uh, so how do I know whether or not a project cost is eligible? So I would, I would start with uh, the schedule of eligible costs, review that. But in general, the categories that are eligible for funding include direct labor. So that's the salary and fringe benefits of the team that's working on the project. Direct materials. So for this call, that's limited to software license fees that are required to um, support the project. Uh, so the third category is subcontractors and consultants. Uh, these subcontractors and consultants um, uh, must be Canadian. We also, tr um, training and travel are both uh, considered eligible costs for, this pro for these projects. So again, here's the, uh, there's a link here to the schedule of eligible costs and, and you'll find that in our call materials. Next slide, Claire, thank you. Are there any limits on the eligible costs that you should be aware of? Uh, yes, there's four. So the first one is that the fringe benefits must not exceed 20% of the direct labor costs. So that's the salaries. The second one you need to be aware of is that the subcontractor and consulting fees must not exceed 5% of the total eligible project costs. And as you're completing the budget template um, that'll accompany your proposal, your application, you'll see that the template will warn you once you hit these maximums. Uh, the third area that you need to be mindful of is that direct uh, software license costs must not exceed 5% of all of total eligible project costs. And last but not least, uh, travel is limited to 3% of total eligible project costs. A uh, question that we get a lot is can you can we include overhead associated with the employees working on the project? And no, unfortunately, you cannot claim any overhead. So that would include um, things like office supplies, utilities, rent, um, printing, those types of things. Uh, can I include sales taxes? So you can include sales taxes to the extent that they're not recoverable from CRA. So it's a non-recoverable portion of the sales tax. 
next slide, please. Uh, when you're preparing the budget, you'll come to the in-kind in kind section. So what qualifies as an in-kind contribution? For this call, uh, in-kind is limited to the salary and benefits of the employees who are working on the project. And, and um, I'd like to just note here that those salary and fringe benefits are the amounts that we would find in your accounting records and your payroll records. Typically, uh, in-kind is included in these, these projects uh, come from university faculty or the, or the PI. Uh, anyone not paid a salary will not qualify as an in-kind contribution. Is there a minimum in-kind contribution? Uh, yes, there is. It's a minimum of 15% of the totally to sorry, the total quarterly eligible project costs. So just a little bit about our funding. It may be different than um, if you already have funding under call 2A or call 2B, you'll um, be familiar with this. But if you're new to our program, you'll find that Canary funding is claims based. And so what that means to you is that during the project, you will submit in quarterly claims. Those are retroactive. Um, once the claim is processed and a check is made to your institution or organization, there'll, it'll be made with a 10% holdback. And the holdback, those holdbacks will accumulate over the course of the project. At the end of the project, we'll release the holdback when the project has been completed. And so completed includes um, meeting all the technical requirements as well as preparing uh, for a final demonstration, a technical, final technical report, and a project audit. So uh, just continuing on about the, the funding model and what, you, what you'll be required to do, uh, once claims are being submitted to Canary, the supporting documentation that's required to, before the first claim is submitted is proof of salary and fringe benefits for all the employees working on the projects. This includes the employees who are contributing in kind. It includes the employees who are coming from participants if you've included them in your project. Um, so that's very important from our perspective. Uh, we can't start paying claims until we have that documentation in place. Once that documentation is in place and claims are starting to come in, uh, we're, we'll be looking for supporting documentation for each of those claims. What supporting documentation is required with the claims? Well, the first thing is that time records must be submitted and they will support the actual uh, hours worked by the project employees. This includes the employees in the in-kind section of the budget um, at, or of the claim, as well as any participants that are working with the lead contractor on the project. We also ask that if there's any expenses over $1,000, so supplier invoices or employee travel expenses, that there is copies of that documentation attached to the claim. Uh, audit requirements. So will the project finances be audited? Yes, all of our projects are, um, will be subject to audit. We generally audit at the end of the project, although um, we have been known to schedule them um, anytime during the project. I'll answer that, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So um, I'll take the questions now. Uh, <clears throat> so we have a question. What details are required for proof of salary and benefits and how detailed? Great, thanks. That's a great question. We get that asked that one a lot. So the type, uh, it, the answer is it depends. It depends on um, your organization, but typically what we would see uh, for proof of salary would be a copy of the payroll records. Um, so that could be coming from an independent payroll provider like Ceridian or ADP or your organization's um, internal payroll uh, generated reports. Uh, sometimes proof of salary comes in um, by way of disclosing a portion of the employee's uh, agreement with, the, with your organization. So it really depends on how your payroll is run at your organization. Uh, from a benefits perspective, that, that again can come from those payroll records. Uh, we also see that coming from benefit um, insurers, 
invoices. So for example, if Great West Life or Sun Life is managing the employee benefits for your organization, they have independent reports that show how much the benefits cost for each employee. So typically we work with your research accounting group um, on what, what they can provide uh, and whether or not it'll qualify from our perspective. Hi, can a single researcher submit a project for his chair? Okay, um, I'm not sure I fully understand this question. Uh, certainly, uh, single researchers are eligible to submit as, as PI. Uh, the requirement is that the, they be employees of the uh, lead contractor, which in most cases would be uh, the university. Next question is, will the slides be sent out after the call? And the slides will be posted online on our website. There's a next question. Uh, what groups are considered contractors for the 5% cap? Are staff from other departments on a, campa on a campus contractors, staff at partnering universities, or staff at partnering government labs? Okay, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, so typically contractors would be subcontractors or contractors that were doing something very specific to support this, the delivery of the statement of work and that would be an independent organization from the lead contractor or from the participants. Um, staff that are being paid through your payroll uh, are never, con uh, never considered contractors. They would be included in the direct labor portion of the claim or of the or of the budget. If you have staff um, from per partnering universities, so I'm referring to those as participants, if you have participants included in your budget and later in your claims, they would be in the direct labor portion of both of those documents. Um, and staff at partnering government labs, uh, so wouldn't qualify for funding if the staff is being paid by the government, um, we wouldn't, they wouldn't qualify as in-kind or as direct labor or as a contractor. Our next question is, if a software platform is provincially funded for development, can we still apply for funding to add collaborators? The platform is established, but I'm unsure if Canary will fund a project that is already funded in some way by a province. So, um, good question. Uh, in that scenario, the project would not be eligible for Canary funding. Uh, would that, that be the case if there was a clear delineation between the provincial funding and the Canary funding was only used yeah. to so, add new users? Yeah, so Scott has a good point. If, if, um, if the funding, if you were applying for Canary funding that was incremental, for, uh, to the project funding that you had already received, then um, we would review that and consider it. It would be eligible for funding under that scenario. Are there any more questions? I'm gonna ask one just because I know about one of the previous questions. So what about government labs fee for service? Pardon me? Government labs uh, fee for service, is that eligible? Yeah, so government labs fee for service is eligible. You'll find that in the schedule of eligible costs um, as an eligible activity. Or if, um, yeah, an eligible activity. Last call for any questions? That's JJ, so that's the fee for, uh, fee for Okay, we'll just, I'll get, I'll ask uh, Tracy to repeat herself, just a second. So uh, fee for service, <coughs> it is an eligible cost. We would want, um, so during the time, if you, if you include that in your budget, uh, during the time uh, when, while we finalize the budget, we would want to dig into uh, what exactly those costs were. We can help you through that. We can help you through that um, while you're preparing your proposals. And so before I finish up, 
I'd, I'd like to recommend that anyone who has questions about the preparing their budget or the schedule of eligible costs, is it eligible, uh, that you contact us through programs at canary.ca and someone on the finance team will be happy to help you through that process. Any more questions? Well, thank you, Tracy and Scott. I think we're all wrapped up. And there's a lot of information on, e on this call and the RDM call online. Thank you very much. Have a good day.